Hi, let's talk about arteries. This is the first part of a two-part set of videos that deals with specific pathways that arteries take to metabolically active tissues. So first, let's talk about the great vessels of the heart. The heart gives off two major arteries, the pulmonary trunk and the aorta. The heart receives several different veins, the superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava, the pulmonary veins, the coronary sinus. In this particular video, we're going to focus on the aorta, and in particular, the branches of the aorta that are superior to the diaphragm. The aorta is tripartite. There's an ascending aorta, which carries blood from the left ventricle up to the arch of the aorta, which is the second part, which then carries blood to the descending aorta, which is the third part. The descending aorta is divided into the thoracic aorta and the abdominal aorta, and the boundary between the two is the diaphragm. There are two branches, as you will recall from our discussion of the heart of the ascending aorta. They are the left and the right coronary arteries. These coronary arteries specifically supply the heart with oxygenated blood. There are typically three branches of the arch of the aorta. They are, in order, the brachiocephalic trunk, which then divides into the right subclavian artery and the right common carotid artery, then the left common carotid artery, and finally, the left subclavian artery. The common carotid arteries serve the neck and the head, whereas the subclavian arteries primarily supply the upper limbs, but they also supply portions of the head, portions of the neck, as well as the thorax with blood. The common carotid arteries ascend the neck within the carotid sheath. So they are bundled together with the internal jugular vein and the vagus nerve in this common bundle of neurovasculature. Approximately at the level of C3, C4, the common carotid artery bifurcates into an internal and an external carotid artery. Typically, the external carotid artery is going to be more anteriorly oriented, whereas the internal carotid artery is more posteriorly oriented. The internal carotid artery is going to be the major supply of blood to the cranial cavity and the brain. It also supplies the eye, the orbit, and portions of the forehead superior to the orbit. The external carotid artery primarily supplies areas of the superior neck, the face, and the scalp with blood. Between the two, external and internal carotid arteries, the lion's share of the head and neck are supplied with blood. The external carotid artery has very many major branches. For instance, there's the superior thyroid artery. The superior thyroid artery is the first major branch from the external carotid, and you can see its origin here. It descends the neck to supply the thyroid gland with blood, and it also provides blood to the superior larynx, or voice box, as well. The lingual artery supplies the tongue and supportive structures with blood. The facial artery supplies the face with blood. Then the ascending pharyngeal, occipital, and posterior auricular arteries are going to supply the deep neck, the neck, and portions of the external head with blood. And then the two terminal branches of the external carotid artery are the maxillary artery and the superficial temporal artery. 
The maxillary artery is going to be transmitted through the infratemporal fossa, and it's going to supply the muscles of mastication. It's also going to supply the maxilla, the teeth of the maxilla, and the dura mater by means of the middle meningeal artery. The superficial temporal artery is going to supply the temporal region of the skull and that skin with blood. The internal carotid artery has numerous small branches, but its major thrust enters the skull through the temporal bone, courses through the carotid canal, and enters into the skull to participate in the supply of blood to the brain. There are several major branches of the internal carotid artery at this point. There's the ophthalmic artery. The ophthalmic arteries supply the eye in the orbit with blood. Then there's the middle cerebral artery, which supplies the middle portion of the cerebrum with blood, and the anterior cerebral artery, which supplies the anterior portion of the cerebrum with blood. There are also communicating branches that are sometimes present for the internal carotid artery, and these communicating branches are going to be anastomoses with derivatives from the vertebral arteries that come from the subclavian artery. In total, all of the anastomoses and branches from the internal carotid artery and the vertebral artery are known as the cerebral circle. And some people hang the eponym, the Circle of Willis, on this. Now it's interesting, most estimates put only about a third of the population as having a complete Circle of Willis, whereas the remainder have some variation. They might be missing a posterior communicating artery, they might be missing an anterior communicating artery, Whatever it is, that the, the circle is incomplete all the way around. But when we look at the constituents of the circle of Willis, from the internal carotid, there's the anterior cerebral and its communicating artery that bridges the two. The middle cerebral arteries and those posterior communicating branches which connect to derivatives of the vertebral artery. Now the vertebral arteries ascend the neck through the transverse foramina of cervical vertebrae one through six. They then enter the skull through the foramen magnum, and they give off posterior inferior cerebellar arteries or pica for short. Pica provides blood to the cerebellum and it also provides an offshoot called posterior spinal arteries of which there are two that are a source of blood for the spine. The vertebral arteries also provide branches to an anterior spinal artery. So there is a single anterior spinal artery and two posterior spinal arteries. The vertebral arteries then come together as the basilar artery, and that basilar artery gives rise to the inferior, inferior cerebellar arteries, or ACA for short that also supply the cerebellum with blood. And then the basilar artery continues on giving off smaller pontine branches 
and eventually gives rise to two sets of branches. There are superior cerebellar arteries, and then the terminal branch of the basilar artery would be the posterior cerebral artery on either side to finish the circle of Willis. Now if you're looking at the inferior portion of the brain, you can see this cerebral circle. One thing in particular to take note of is cranial nerve 3, the oculomotor nerve, nestles right here between the superior cerebellar artery and the posterior cerebral artery. And as a consequence of this, if there's ever an aneurysm in either of these two arteries, that can squeeze the oculomotor nerve and it can provide a lot of trouble for movements of that particular eye as a result that's controlled by those extrinsic eye muscles. So here we can see the cerebral circle on a cadaveric brain. So we can see very quickly, here is the cerebellum, here is the cerebrum, and the temporal lobes have been pulled apart so that we can have better access to, uh, to see the brain and its vasculature. Here are the internal carotid arteries, our middle cerebral arteries, our anterior cerebral arteries, our communicating artery, our anterior communicating artery, our posterior communicating arteries. Here we can see the vertebral arteries and you can see there's a little bit of variation with respect to their size here. Ascending. There's our anterior spinal artery. There's pica. Not shown would be the posterior spinal arteries. Those would be behind the spinal cord. Here's the basilar artery, some of the pontine branches. And then the superior cerebellar artery. And then the posterior cerebral artery. And let me clear all that away and nestled here between the posterior cerebral and superior cerebellar artery is the oculomotor nerve, cranial nerve number three. Next we have the subclavian artery. The right subclavian artery, as you'll recall, branches from the brachiocephalic trunk. The left subclavian artery branches directly from the arch of the aorta. The subclavian artery is tripartite. There are three parts to it, and those parts are named due to their relative position to this muscle here, which is the anterior scalene. The anterior scalene originates on the transverse processes of cervical vertebrae, and it inserts on the scalene tubercle of the first rib. All of the branches of the subclavian that are medial to the anterior scalene are of the first part. Any of the parts of the subclavian that are behind the anterior scalene are of the second part. And any of the branches that are lateral to the anterior scalene all the way out to the margin of rib one is the third part. Now the first part of the subclavian artery has three major branches. There's the vertebral artery. That vertebral artery is going up to participate in the circle of Willis. There's the internal thoracic artery, which is going to descend the thorax, send branches to the pericardium, but predominantly provide blood to the intercostal spaces of the anterior and, and lateral walls of the thorax. And then the thyrocervical trunk. The thyrocervical trunk typically has four major branches. There's the inferior thyroid, which is supplying the thyroid gland and parathyroid glands with blood, as well as the inferior larynx. 
There's the ascending cervical artery, which supplies the deep neck muscles with blood. There's the transverse cervical artery, which supplies the trapezius muscle with blood. And then there's the suprascapular artery, which supplies some of the rotator cuff muscles, supra and infraspinatus, with blood. The second part of the subclavian artery, which is obscured by the anterior scalene, provides us with the costocervical trunk. The costocervical trunk supplies blood to the two superior most intercostal spaces, as well as some of the deep muscles of the neck. And then the third part of the subclavian artery gives rise to the dorsal scapular artery, typically. That dorsal scapular artery supplies blood to some of the back muscles, uh, rhomboid major, rhomboid minor, uh, levator scapulae. Um, and while this typically arises from the third part of the subclavian, it may also arise from the transverse cervical artery. In about a third of the population, the dorsal scapular artery is a branch of the transverse cervical artery. The subclavian artery is going to become the axillary artery at the lateral margin of the first rib. So anything beyond the lateral margin of the first rib is therefore known as the axillary artery. And the axillary artery is transmitted through the axilla, or what we would colloquially refer to as the armpit. And the axillary artery is a very important anatomical landmark for different portions of the brachial plexus, which you can see here, which are the nerves that are going to provide both sensory and motor innervation to the upper limb. After the inferior margin of the teres major muscle, which is approximately there, the axillary artery is known as the brachial artery. And the brachial artery provides blood to the brachium, or the arm. That's the region between your shoulder and your elbow. Towards the distal brachium, the brachial artery is going to bifurcate into its terminal branches, the radial and the ulnar arteries. So here we can see the brachial artery descending, and it's at the antebrachium, and then it divides into the radial artery, which supplies the lateral arm, or forearm with blood, and the ulnar artery, which supplies the medial forearm with blood. The radial artery, moving along the lateral aspect of the forearm, is a major pulse point. So you can, you can determine blood flow in part to the hand and pulse rate by palpating your radial artery. That artery goes deep within the hand, and it gives rise to the deep palmar arch. The ulnar artery, which is more medial, gives rise to the superficial palmar arch. And these two arteries between the arches are going to anastomose to provide good collateral blood flow to the hand. In some individuals, these anastomoses are not present. And so they truly rely on both the radial and the ulnar arteries to fully supply blood to the hand and the, the digits of the hand. Beyond the arch of the aorta, we have the thoracic aorta, and the thoracic aorta is going to descend inferiorly to the diaphragm. There are several visceral branches. Visceral branches supply blood to viscera, and then there are many parietal branches to the thoracic aorta. In particular, you can see here coming off of the aorta, these are examples of bronchial arteries, 
bronchial arteries supply the bronchi of the lungs with blood. There are also esophageal arteries to supply the esophagus with blood. There are pericardial branches to supply the pericardium with blood. In terms of parietal branches, there are posterior intercostal arteries. Posterior intercostal arteries supply intercostal spaces with blood. You can see some of them here. There's one, there's another, there's another, there's another. There are also subcostal arteries. Subcostal arteries supply the abdominal wall inferior to the ribcage with blood. And superior phrenic arteries, which supply the superior portions of the rectus abdominis muscle with blood. At the level of the diaphragm, though, the thoracic aorta is transitioned into the abdominal aorta. Now we've discussed the major branches of the ascending aorta, the arch of the aorta, and the thoracic aorta. Stay tuned to find out the branches that come off of the abdominal aorta. Thank you.